Okay, folks, I can see we're coming up on one minute after the hour, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Matt Thomas, and thank you for tuning in to the USGS Landslide Hazards Seminar. Uh, this meeting is hosted by the Landslide Hazards Program and is co-organized with contributions from Stephen Slaughter and Jamie Kostelnik. Uh, for those of you that are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or to use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and uh, video camera. Um, we typically wait until the end of the presentation to take questions, so in the meantime, Please just do your best to make sure your microphone is muted when you're not intending to speak. Uh, Jason, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you for today's introduction. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm pleased to introduce Francis Rangers. Um, Francis uh, started at the USGS in 2014 as a Mendenhall Fellow. And prior to that, Francis received uh, his PhD in geology from the University of Colorado, uh, a master's in geology from Colorado State and uh, a bachelor's in both geology and French from West Virginia University. Um, over the past seven and a half years, Francis has worked primarily on post-fire debris flows, but has also done some work in on landslides in unburned areas, as you'll see in his talk. So um, without any further wait, let's I'll pass it off to Francis. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, for coming to the talk. Thanks so much, uh, Matt, for the organization um, of these meetings. Um, Matt's done a really, really awesome job creating this fantastic seminar. Um, and thanks to Jason, who's literally the first person I talk to about every project and, and the last person I talk to about every project. So, um, so today I, I'm gonna talk about debris flows and I just wanna start with a visual of what I mean when I say debris flow. So, this is just a still image taken from a, a video that um, Jason Keene and, and Joel Smith captured at the Chalk Cliffs. And you can see there's a slurry of water and sediment that's coming down this channel. And I'm going to start with a um, definition of a debris flow um, that's out of Dick Iverson's 1997 paper. And I love this definition because it reads kind of like a poem. And I really like uh, the poetic nature of this text. So Dick said, Debris flows occur when masses of poorly sorted sediment, agitated and saturated with water, surge down slopes in response to gravitational attraction, whereas solid grain forces dominate the physics of avalanches and fluid forces dominate the physics of floods, solid and fluid forces must, must act in concert to produce a debris flow. So debris flows are this sort of special animal that um, lives at the intersection between fluidized flow and granular flow. And one of the reasons um, that people care a lot about debris flows um, is they are really destructive. So as you can see in this um, photo, the, there's a debris flow in Montecito, California, that is basically um, up to the eaves on this house. So they're a real threat to life and infrastructure. Francis, just one moment. Your uh, task yep. bar has popped up on the bottom if you're able to make that go away. If not, no, no problem. Uh, no. Uh, let's try this again. Is that is that gone away now, Matt? Yep, that's good. Let me try. Sorry, one thing. OK, can you see my full screen now? Yep, you're all good. Thanks. Sorry about that, everybody. One of the things I want to um, just make a distinction on um, about debris flows early on is there's a couple different types of initiation. So I want to hit on those um, early in the talk so we're all on the same page. So some debris flows start when shallow landslides then uh, fluidize and move downstream. And so, for example, in this photo, I've outlined a few shallow landslides um, and then you can see their travel paths. So the shallow landslides begin um, and then it becomes a debris flow as it moves downstream. But there's another mechanism um, that uh, and how debris flows initiate, and this is runoff generation. So sometimes it looks like this, where there's lots of rills um, that are coming down a hill slope, um, and eventually uh, the sediment concentration can be high, become high enough that it becomes a debris flow. Um, sometimes the runoff generation looks a little differently. It doesn't even have to be from rills. So here's an example um, where you had kind of a combination of um, a head cut moving migrating upstream and then water flow downstream and it was sufficient to start to erode into the channel um, so here's the beginning of this debris flow and 
uh, for scale, there's Jason Keen, and I can verify he's very tall. He's probably 6'2", 6'3". Um, so then if you look uh, a little bit further downstream, this is the same channel. Um, here again, there's Jason Keen for scale, and you can see now we're about two Jason Keens tall. Um, so, you know, it, it's clearly um, debris flow channel, um, but that's just another sort of runoff generation. So there's lots of tools uh, that we use to understand debris flow processes um, with things like modeling, in-situ measurements, seismic, uh, just straight up mapping, um, INSAR, LIDAR, and photogrammetry. And um, my work generally fits in, the, in four of those categories and, and probably will continue to stay in those categories. Um, but today, really, I just want to talk about LIDAR and photogrammetry. I just want to tell you what we've been doing the past few years um, to bring these tools to bear on debris flow processes um, in some kind of new and unique ways. So here's our roadmap for today. We're basically going to follow uh, the life cycle of mass movement. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, debris flow initiation. Um, we're going to look at non-contact observations um, of landslides that, that are generated at the USGS debris flow flume. Um, we're going to look at debris flow step spacing in fluvial hollows. Um, then we're going to move on to the transport phase. So this is as debris flows are moving down a channel. Um, I'm going to show you how we use LIDAR to measure debris flow velocity um, and how we look at um, erosion patterns using LIDAR and tie that um, with respect to uh, geology and rock strength. Then we're going to look at deposition. Um, we'll talk about how we can use LIDAR as structure for motion to look at topographic controls on debris flow dynamics um, and how that leads to deposition at different sites. And then, then finally, you might think, well, that, that's kind of it, but, but there's this fourth piece where once you scour a channel with the debris flow, you have to refill it. And so I'll just tell you a little bit about um, the project uh, we did with frost weathering um, at the Chalk Cliffs in Colorado. So let's start off with uh, debris flow initiation, um, thinking about landslides. So we started a, um, a project at the USGS debris flow flume, basically asking the question, can we use uh, a non-contact approach of LIDAR or cameras to understand the onset of failure of a landslide. And you might think, well, why would I need that? So here's an example, this Rattlesnake Ridge example of um, a large landslide where people knew it was beginning. There were, there were tension cracks. Um, this threatened uh, a highway. Um, and it's not the kind of place that you would want to um, have to walk on if you could. So we wanted to use a, a really downscaled um, experiment at the flume to see if we could flesh out some non-contact ways of trying to estimate um, landslide movement. So this work was primarily led by uh, Thomas Rapstein, who was a PhD student at the Colorado School of Mines. Um, and the cartoon that you can see shows uh, this experimental setup. So we have um, a prism of sediment, and there are th three um, poor water pressure sensors that are shown by stars. Um, we had water coming in to the sediment saturating both from the bottom and via rainfall at the top um, and it's set on a slope and there's a kind of wooden uh, triangle at the base that's holding the sediment back so it only can um, flow over that uh, this wooden triangle um, once the landslide starts um, we had two fixed cameras that were looking at the landslide um, and also a mounted lidar and so I'll show you a video um, of the experiment. This is uh, what it looked like when the landslide started. And I just want to remind folks that um, we didn't know when this landslide was going to start. So we waited quite a long time and we just kind of hung out until we thought it might start. So here we go on the video. So that's the video um, of the landslide initiated debris flow. And um, so Thomas Rapstein, our student um, that, that was working on this, he took um, the two fixed cameras. And um, so you can see 
camera view one and camera view two here. Um, and they were recording at 30 frames per second. And what he was able to do is to create um, a digital elevation model um, for each of those frames. So he was able to create 30 digital elevation models per second. And if Thomas were here, um, he would want me to tell you um, that this approach is not um, traditional structure of emotion, um, which uses um, uh, multiple camera poses around a static scheme. So here's a, a cartoon that I borrowed from a, a UNAVCO tutorial, um, just to kind of remind you, you know, this is traditional structure for motion. Um, but rather what, what this approach used was two fixed cameras recording a dynamic scene. Um, and so this approach was a combination of structure for motion and stereo video. We also had a LiDAR unit set up. So here's a, an image of what our LiDAR unit looks like. Um, and normally this kind of LiDAR um, spins around the base in 360 degrees. But we basically fixed it so it, it barely spun at all. Um, and then there's a little mirror um, in that cutout area and that mirror rotated at uh, 60 hertz. So we were able to get a line um, down that debris flow um, every 1 60th of a second. So here are a couple of videos showing you um, the both the camera and oh, I'm just going to start. Oh, no. Sorry, everybody. I think I might have to change to not be a laser pointer. There we go. OK, so you should see these start. These are two profiles. One's a video and one's from the LiDAR. So there you go. And they look pretty similar, although you can actually see that the LiDAR is a little bit choppier because we get sort of some shadow zones, uh, whereas the cameras were up a little bit higher um, and they just didn't record uh, any shadows like that. So it was a little smoother. What was interesting about this approach is we were able to use this to infer a dilation rate. Um, so Thomas did some really interesting work to, to figure this out, but we were able to um, generate a dilation rate estimate based on measurements of the topography from cameras. Um, so he looked at, he was able to calculate change in height with time, change in velocity um, with respect to the X direction downstream. Um, and he could compare that dilation rate based on video observations with the dilation rate um, that uses um, measured values like basal pore pressure. And, you know, in the real world, if we have a landslide that you're worried about, you're probably not going to be able to um, place a um, pore pressure sensor um, at the bottom of it if you're really worried that it might fail. So, um, yeah, we saw pretty good agreement between these two dilation rates. Um, and so that allowed us to kind of um, show that you can use these fixed cameras or fixed LiDAR to try and estimate dilation rate, um, to try and give you some information um, predicting landslide initiation. Okay, so the next kind of initiation I want to tell you about is um, debris flow uh, runoff initiation. So, you know, if you look at a slope um, that has rills, like you can see in this photo, um, there's a question of how do you get from the rills to um, a full debris flow? Um, because it's not just a matter of picking up sediment, you have to reach sediment concentrations that are high enough, about about 40% um, to have a debris flow. So um, Jason Keen developed a, a really useful um, approach to think about this, and, and it's called the sediment capacitor model. And so the sediment capacitor model you know, allows us to, to see that um, sediment can build up in these low spots and channels, um, and then it can fail. And so that's one way to jack up the um, uh, sediment concentration really high. Um, but in real world landscapes, you might think, well, but are there all these, you know, steps that can retain sediment that can fail? Um, and I can say that we do see this actually quite a bit, especially in the burned areas that I'm used to to work working in and walking around. There's actually often a lot of steps around 
Um, so um, we did an analysis to look at where these steps come from. Um, and this site used um, a terrestrial LIDAR data set um, that basically starts at the top of a ridge and kind of goes down to a, um, a zero order channel. It's a colluvial hollow um, that then got incised. And so what we saw with in this case, um, we did six different surveys um, of this landscape and in between surveys five and six, um, there was a really large rainstorm in the Colorado Front Range in 2013. Um, and that created um, some steps uh, in the channel. And so we were able to, you know, look at the, the change um, in the topography before and after the steps and including um, several surveys up to the, up to the first survey. Um, what we did was we extracted 25 longitudinal profiles um, in this colluvial hollow for each of the different surveys. And then we um, used a linear regression line to uh, take out the slope. So, so there wasn't the slope um, in it. And we ran a fast Fourier transform on these to look at the spectral power um, to try and get a sense of if there is any kind of consistent spacing. Here's a view um, of the steps. So on the left, the figure A, um, you can see uh, the numbers one, two, three, four. Um, and then in cross section, those are those same numbers where um, the yellow points indicate uh, the original surface. And then um, the true color, which is underneath, you can kind of see these steps. So in between uh, three and two, you see this kind of nice step. And then between two and one, you see a nice step. So what we saw um, was there was this peak in spectral power um, at about uh, two meters um, where we saw steps at that survey six. But what was interesting is when we put this in the context of all the other surveys, we also see a, a peak in spectral power um, in the same place. And what this means is um, these steps in the landscape where you have sediment in between they kind of work like uh, a staircase that's covered in snow. So you might cover a staircase in snow, but you might, if you had a fine enough um, a measurement technique, you, you might be able to still see um, the effect of the stairs um, that are underneath that snow. So that's kind of the, um, the observation that we made in this case. So the takeaway from this runoff initiation um, is that we can use LIDAR to estimate uh, these pre-erosional step spacing and LIDAR um, really helped explain the runoff generation generated debris flows and it helps to support this sediment capacitor theory. So now let's move on from initiation to transport. So debris flows moving down a channel. Um, we're going to start back at the flume um, and I just want to uh, yeah so I'll show you the LIDAR setup. So we set it up down at the base. Um, again, instead of rotating all the way around, um, we fixed it. So it was just looking straight up the channel. Um, and I'll show you a video of what it looks like when you uh, have a debris flow coming down. So um, that the top two plots, the X axis is the distance along the flume. The top plot um, is in uh, true elevation. The middle plot is the normalized depth. So this is the um, depth above uh, the flume surface. Um, and then the bottom plot is the velocity through time. And you can notice that we're actually able to resolve the debris flow front pretty well um, with the LIDAR. And we have a really nice continuous view um, of the flow all the way down the channel. Whoops. The other thing we can do with this is we can um, use this LIDAR data to make observations about what's going on with the flow dynamics. For example, um, on the left, um, sediments released out of a head gate and there's kind of this sharp front and then starts to get a little bit fuzzy as grains start to segregate. And we can actually see this in the LIDAR data. So the top plot um, again shows the uh, flume height. So this is the um, height above the flume. Um, along the x direction on the x axis. 
Um, and then the bottom plot B here is the normalized uh, flow depth. And you can really clearly see the start of the saltating front. So um, it's, it, yeah, this LIDAR approach shows that it's pretty helpful, but um, more than just a technique, we wanna, you know, apply this to uh, science questions. Um, so uh, Ryan Jones, who's a, a postdoc um, at the USGS here in Golden, um, has been applying DCLAW to this data set to look at how a model compares to what we observed um, with the LIDAR. And he's able to get some pretty tight, um, tight uh, comparisons between the model and the LIDAR. So on all these plots, what you're looking at is time on the x-axis and then depth on the y-axis here. Um, and then he's just pulled out different locations, um, five meters, 15 meters, 25 meters. These are just different places down the flume. Um, and you can see that his model, this red line, um, corresponds pretty well in terms of depth and timing um, to the LIDAR in blue here. He's also um, using LIDAR data that we um, collected at the bottom of the flume, so uh, where we got the runout to compare his modeling um, with the runout. So this technique is kind of helping to to drive some model experiments um, because models always need to be tested against, uh, you know, something real. The other thing that we've done um, with LIDAR is to look at the influence of geology um, on transported debris flows. Um, so I'm gonna highlight some work here that, that many of you may have already seen, but this is work um, with collaborating with uh, Kirk Townsend and Marin Clark and Steve DeLong on. And we were looking at debris flows that originated in this Woolsey fire um, near Malibu in Southern California in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, and we were able to use a two different um, LIDAR data sets to see the effect of post-fire debris flows. Um, one of the really cool things that um, Kirk and Marin Clark had done was they measured rock strength in this area um, prior to the LIDAR difference. So we were able to use the LIDAR to compare different measures of rock strength. So um, Schmidt hammer, um, geological strength index, um, and shear strength, and we compare that against slope. And then these dots are colored by how much erosion uh, flux we saw um, in, yeah, at different slopes. And what we see is this clear trend where um, the stronger rocks, actually, you see um, the most erosion um, on the highest slopes. And if you think about that, it kind of makes a lot of sense because um, strong rocks should hold up steeper slopes and um, erosion of sediment that's in a channel um, should increase when that channel's steeper. Um, so this is kind of a really cool um, combination of using um, LIDAR and um, being able to tie that to rock strength measures. Okay, so for debris flow transport, big takeaway is our, our modified LIDAR system allowed us to continuously track debris flow um, from the surge front all the way to the watery tail. Um, and it's been helpful for modeling. And the LIDAR differencing paired with the rock strength shows the influence of geology on erosion. All right, so if you're keeping score at home, we're about halfway through because next I'm going to move on to talking about debris flow deposition. And here I'm really going to concentrate on um, using LIDAR and structure for motion to answer the, the where and why of debris flow deposition. So I'll start by um, just showing you a structure for motion model that we made from drone imagery um, at the Woodbury fire. So we flew a drone over this fire um, right after the fire and it was really really hot i think it was 117 degrees <laughs> we flew the drone we got this topography before it rained um and it was really fortuitous because we were able to go back um after a rainstorm um and get another flight so um a lot of this work is presented um, in this paper led by luke mcguire and um, i'll just point out that the rain that we saw um, was really high intensity so if you um, look here on the x-axis, you have time, uh, local time, and then the blue line shows the rainfall intensity. You can see we're peaking over uh, 100 millimeters per hour here. Um, and on that secondary y-axis is pressure recorded in a pressure transducer. And you can see a really high spike 
um, as a debris flow passes a pressure transducer. Um, so we had a pretty good flow and um, we were able to yeah, collect that second um, structure for motion data set about 10 days after um, the rainstorm that caused the debris flow. So I, I want to show you this um, this difference model that we have of the topography. So um, the, the line arrow here is indicating the direction of flow. Um, the red colors are erosion, the blue colors are deposition. Um, and what you can see is that um, there's a pretty clean break between erosion upstream and then um, the flow comes over a, a little bit of a waterfall here um, and then it really starts immediately depositing. So it's you can basically put your finger on that transition from erosion to deposition. Um, it gets a little muddled down at the bottom of the catchment because there's a head cut that erodes up, um, so it, it makes it uh, net erosional. Um, but it's pretty obvious that uh, before this head cut moved up from the stream that it was kind of net depositional the whole way down. Um, one of the great things about you know these kind of data sets is we can use them to look at volumes. So in this case, um, there's about 1,200 uh, cubic meters um, of deposition with an average depth of about 0.229 centimeters. Not every place is as clean as that with, with the separation of um, erosion and deposition, though. So here, I'm going to show you um, an example from uh, the Van Tassel watershed. And um, so you're looking at a longitudinal profile. The dots are colored uh, in these bins, um, either erosion, which is red, deposition, which is blue. And then you might notice along this black line, um, there's some missing dots. And that just means that it's between um, the plus or minus 15 centimeters. This is our level of detection. So that's why there's no data there. Um, so we're looking um, uh, from upstream to downstream, and we're following this dashed line in the watershed. And just for slight more context, um, I'm just pointing out here where the tributary confluences are that you can see on the map. So one of the things that we've seen in this area is kind of three zones. So there really is an erosion dominant zone and there really is a, a deposition dominant zone, but there's kind of a mixed area in between. Um, so one of the first things we did was look at this in the context of slope. Um, so I'll just take take that figure um, and show another figure below it. Um, so the the x axis um, is still distance um, along the longitudinal profile, but now um, the y axis is um, deposition. So the blue bars are deposition in the positive area, and then um, erosion is shown as the blue bars that are negative here. On the secondary uh, x axis, that orange color is the slope in degrees. And one of the things that we kind of noticed is that between five and 10 degrees, um, that's kind of where you see most of your deposition. When, you're, when your slope is um, in the zone or, or lower, um, that's basically where you see deposition and everywhere else um, you tend to see as erosional. Um, but we wanted to bring in a few extra factors here. Um, so I explored this uh, stream power term, um, which is is commonly used, you know, in water flows. And the reason it's not truly applicable, um, you know, in this case is because we can't really assume a constant density, like a, a constant density of water. Um, but what I wanted to do is pull out um, some topographic metrics from this to see if that might help us to understand where deposition uh, might happen. And so if you take this stream power term and then you break the discharge um, into a precipitation minus infiltration, and then you lump all the topographic factors into this alpha term. So, so this alpha term can be cast as drainage area times the slope, that's a friction slope, um, divided by the channel width. And that's something that can be easily calculated um, with a LIDAR data set. And so we did that and you actually see a decent um, trend. So um, that alpha stream power factor um, is on the x-axis here and on the y-axis um, is the net change. So again, positive um, values indicate um, 
deposition and negative values indicate erosion. But what about areas in forested catchments? I mean, you wouldn't think that you can use these kind of topographic metrics from LIDAR um, to indicate where debris flow is going to stop if it's just held back by a bunch of trees in the channel. Um, yeah, topography alone probably isn't going to help you. Um, so I've recently been investigating the role of wood in debris flows. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about a study I've been working on um, in the Tadpole Fire in New Mexico. So this fire happened in um, 2020, and we were able to get some instruments out to the site um, in that summer before there was rainfall, and um, we saw debris flows. And we measured about uh, 136 unique uh, debris flow deposits in four primary drainages. We um, we classified different um, wood in terms of some categories that we borrowed from the fluvial literature. So um, bridge is where you have a piece of wood that just spans across um, the channel. Um, it's not actually touching the bottom. Buried um, is wood that's buried within the debris flow. Um, a jam is multiple pieces of wood. Um, loose is just sitting on top of uh, the debris flow deposit. Um, we also saw a few non-debris, non-large uh, woody debris deposits, so there's no wood involved. And then ramp um, is sort of a special category where part of the wood is in the channel and part of it's up on the bank. So we just borrowed all these terms um, from the literature, and we saw a lot of things like this. So this would be uh, a buried piece of wood um, that's helping to hold back this debris flow sediment. Um, here's another buried piece of wood. Um, but unlike the last one, so this one is pinned by a tree. Um, this one's not really pinned by anything. It just kind of stopped, but it's buried and helping to hold back debris flow sediment. So in all, we measured 267 wood pieces and 136 unique deposits. And the way that we used LIDAR in this is there was pre-event LIDAR, and we looked at the channel width. So I was able to create um, cross sections uh, every five meters in the channel from the LIDAR data. And then I took the cross sections and um, I normalized them so that the thaw wag of the cross section, so the lowest point was always centered on zero. Um, and, and then we could um, look to either side to help to try and create a standardized channel width. So the way that I did that, whoops, uh, the way that I did that was to start from that zero point um, and then look both to the left and to the right um, and find the point um, that was one meter above the thaw wag. And the reason um, we kind of concentrated on a width of one meter above the thaw wag was that was about the um, typical depth uh, that we saw in most of the debris flows that we observed in the field. So we created this database of width. Um, and then what we looked at was uh, the length of woody debris. So we created this ratio on the bottom. So it's the wood length divided by the channel width. Um, and then we plotted that versus the sediment volume that we measured in the field. And um, there are three categories that you'll see here, uh, buried, jam, and ramp. Um, so yeah, I kind of already explained those. Um, and then we just um, indicated which were kind of the bigger debris flow deposits by throwing on um, this line at 10 cubic meters. We also tried to indicate um, if the debris was pinned. Like again, in this case, it's pinned by a couple of trees that are helping to hold back this large woody debris, um, or if it wasn't pinned. So the pinned um, areas are now shown with a star on top of them. And one of the things we noticed when we looked at this data that there was kind of a, a special zone in between 0.25 and 1. So if the sediment, if the wood length was less than a quarter of the channel width, we didn't see a whole lot of um, large sediment volumes. And if the wood length was larger than the channel width, 
Um, we again didn't see a lot of really large volumes. And the way that you get, you might be thinking, how do you get a wood length larger than channel width? Well, not all the wood is exactly oriented um, perpendicular to the flow. Sometimes it's a little oblique, especially these ramps, um, which are partly in the channel, partly on the bank. Um, so you can have wood that's longer um, than a channel width. But there's kind of a sweet spot here um, between a quarter and one uh, ratio of wood length to channel width. So here are a few takeaways from our debris flow deposition. Um, we can we can use metrics to get to the where and why, um, like this alpha metric um, that might be useful to estimate where and why we see deposition. Um, and this can be estimated from LIDAR prior to an event. In watersheds where woody debris retains sediment, LIDAR can be used to estimate where sediment might accumulate by using this approach that I outlined to estimate width and then um, using an estimated um, uh, wood length. So those are a couple things you could do before an event to try and estimate where deposition might happen. All right, so the last piece I'm going to talk about is debris flow refilling. And here I'm going to talk about how we use structure for motion um, to get at the rate and controls on debris flow filling. So what you're looking at in this photo is the channel in the chalk cliffs that's scoured all the way down to bedrock. And this was in um, September of 2015. Then we went back and did another survey um, in June of 2016. So um, basically, we started in the fall and let winter happen. Then we came back at the end of winter. And you can see there's a lot of sediment that's accumulated um, in the channel in between those two. Um, so Jason Keene and, and Jeff Coe and, and Joel Smith um, designed a really, really cool uh, approach for tracking um, sediment and trying to link that to temperature at this site. So um, they created the sediment wall. And as you can see in the, the series of photos, if you kind of look from left to right and down, um, you can see that as it snows and it's cold, you start to get um, sediment accumulating um, against the sediment fence. And that can be tied um, to thermistors um, that were embedded in the rock um, and, and the temperature that's measured with depth. So we use that data um, and we use structure for motion. And for the structure for motion, we drilled these bolts into the rock. So here's four examples of bolts. And we use those bolts um, for both basically as controls for our structure for motion. Um, but we also used them as independent um, tie point uh, erosion pens. And the thing that we saw at the end of this um, first season, just, just a single winter, is lots of deposition. So our map um, shows, again, erosion in red, deposition in blue. Um, and if you look in this um, inset figure B here, um, if you draw your eye to the red line, you can see the sediment accumulation rate um, from those two profiles. And um, there are quite a few potholes uh, along the um, length of the channel, and those are filling up with um, 40 centimeters, almost half a half a meter of sediment in some places. So there was a lot of sediment deposition, um, and we were able to back that out using structure for motion. Um, and then we were able to use observations from the sediment fence to make um, to make predictions of sediment production. So here I'm just going to show uh, one plot. We have quite a few more in the paper, um, but where we look at um, air temperature versus sediment production, and we see a really tight correlation. So when it's cold, we get a lot of sediment coming off of um, the hill slopes and moving into the channel. Um, and then that decreases uh, as it warms up. So our takeaway for uh, debris flow refilling is that structure for motion allows us to see the rate of refilling of colluvium into a channel. Um, instrumentation uh, was used to help illustrate this control on sediment refilling. Um, and in this case, temperature uh, was in the main instrument that we relied on. So to kind of wrap things up, in terms of initiation, we're able to use um, 
cameras and LiDAR to estimate the dilation rate when landslides begin. Um, we were able to estimate the potential step spacing with LiDAR as well. In terms of debris flow transport, um, we showed that you can use this line scan method um, of a, a ground-based LiDAR to track debris flows, and you can associate um, the debris flow erosion patterns um, and large drainage basins with, with rock strength. And then in terms of deposition, um, we can use topography to estimate locations of deposition, um, even in areas where wood plays a pretty large role. And then finally, um, debris flow refilling, um, we can use repeat structure for motion and instrumentation to estimate the rate and control on that refilling. So with that, I think I'll wrap it up and uh, take any questions that you might have.